and welcome to Take Charge of Your Data with the Field API. From common content to custom creations, I sold some promises there. Um, today I'm going to introduce the Drupal Field API, and it's one of many in Drupal 4, and it's been around for a while, so I hope you leave this session understanding some of the risks and liabilities with writing custom code, but you're interested and you're ready to try something that, that maybe you've never done before. It's called a little mayhem, as we were just talking about. Uh, introduce myself, I am Jim Bomero. I am an engineering manager at Four Kitchens, and uh, I have over 10 years of Drupal experience. I use it for all my nerdy hobbies, from running calculations for homebrewing beer, to um, planning out retro arcade projects, to teaching kids how to survive the zombie apocalypse at local summer camps. If you have any questions, I uh, would be happy to keep this conversation going, either here or um, on all the webs as in Jim. So let's keep talking. So today's session, uh, and when I really think about my history with Drupal, the field API is super important to me. The idea of fieldable content is why I fell in love with Drupal. I don't think anyone else was doing it well, that you can build your own content types with very limited code in a very predictable way. And you know, the CCK module has since evolved, oh, I'm so glad there's still love, into something that's in core. And we have these, these APIs now that we're going to get introduced today. In fact, we're going to look at three types of plugins. We're going to look at custom field types. That's where the data is stored, uh, which is largely a solved problem. So hopefully we won't do too much on that one. Custom widgets, how do you interact with it? And I was showing some examples of bad UI, but you might want to do your powers, superpowers for good. And finally, custom formatters. This is a kind of a close to the theming layer as you can get, but I can still call it back end and I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. But how do you want to present data that's in your database to the end user? Uh, so let's go through those three. We're going to start with the custom field types. And uh, I would say this is the least approachable and probably the one you need to know the least about. It is more technically complex because when we're talking about custom field types, we're thinking about the database and everything that goes with the database. How do you sort, filter? Um, if you're not comfortable with topics like integrity checks validation or how things index or if you don't know the pros and cons of why you would use a varchar, this topic's not for you. I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on it. But there are still cases where this matters. Few and far between, though, because thanks to people in this room, people at this conference, a lot of the cases we need are now in Drupal core, right? There's a date field. We don't have to have a random bar chart and call it a date. There are fields for things like links and even telephone numbers. So some of the examples I'm going to show on my next slide are kind of trivial. Install the module, they're good. Only if you need something extra should you even consider going to roll your own. Some examples, and this is I, this makes me feel like my Drupal 5, 6 days, when everything was text. And it was like, good luck, you know, enter your birthday. Who knows what you're going to get? Um, address, just good luck. Just put whatever the hell you want. Maybe we'll, we'll be able to validate it. Uh, Twitter, oh, I should have changed that, I guess. Uh, you know, do you need the at sign? Is it a fully qualified path? I don't really know. But from having to, to manage this, you know, you get garbage data in. Now you have to do all this post-processing to do something useful with it. And so for all of the ones, I'm going to just highlight a few. You need to ask yourself, is there a business reason that you want to take ownership of the storage of this data? And sometimes the answer is yes. So if I was working on a web app where it was doing something interactive with phone numbers, well, now it's super important that I store phone numbers in a predictable way. It's probably just an integer, but maybe not. Maybe I want to also check what carrier you're on. I want to get opt-in to send you notifications. So there's a lot of things I could do. Uh, and just having a simple bar chart field, Strings in, who knows? People are going to add different characters, different spaces, different symbols. Call now, you have to consider internationalization and what that transforms things into. Um, this, this could be tough, and it might be a case for creating custom storage. Uh, look at a couple more before I get to something that, that is definitely a case. Uh, same thing with birthdays. Luckily, there is a date format. So if you, if you need a date, you're probably going to use the Smart Date module. If you want something that looks kind of like you know, a Google or a calendaring app, or just the regular date and date range. Those tools are mature now and use them. But let's say there is a reason you had some custom variation, some custom validation, or you're doing just something very technical with this data, you might need to create a, uh, a type for this. And, and definitely if you ever worked in e-commerce, currency fields are a landmine of issue. It's just so difficult to know what's right and wrong. Even if I start off saying, okay, everything's just gonna be an integer and I'm gonna keep things in US cents, uh, that can work. And then later on, I can worry about the formatting of these things. When I use decimal points, when I don't, 
if I would like to say something like free, maybe I put in a random word, and if I, that word comes up, then a, a banner displays. But it all of a sudden gets more complicated if you have to convert this to other currencies. So there are some workarounds. It can get complicated. Uh, for example, on some sites that I've worked on in the past with currency, I'd have one field which was like the programmatic one, an integer, and then another one which is actually displayed to the user, and I can dress it up and put phrases in like two for five dollars rather than putting you know two two point two five. I think a more valid use case and the one I have much more recent experience for creating custom field types is when I want to add shape to something. And we'll look in the database before this is done, but Drupal, we do a really great job uh, normalizing everything. Is that a denormalizing? Which one is it? It's one of those. It's one or it's the other, where everything's broken down in the database uh, into its separate fields. So we don't often think about uh, a table in the database having multiple values. But there are times when it makes sense, where a bunch of things group together nicely. The link field is one I'll probably show off as an example. We don't just want the URL, we want the title text, maybe there's some attributes, it opens in a new window. All of these things go together as a collection, so we'll call that giving it some sort of a shape on a back-end data sense. I'll propose for you know something like identity, you know, all these sort of things about me, my name. This is something that might need more shape. It doesn't make sense for me to add a prefix field, first name, middle name, last name, suffix, preferred name, anything else that you might add into that identity because those are individual fields and now I have to write a bunch of logic to tie them together every time. And if I want to use this field in multiple places, maybe this is a field that's on a profile content type for displaying me, but it's also on a news content type for a byline, it's on an event content type for a press reasons someone needs to contact. I want to reuse these fields at a, at a field level, not at entity level. We're all used to entity references. You don't really have field references. That's what a field is. So I might want to create a custom field type. And we see this already in Drupal in quite a few places. Uh, dates have complicated data stored, especially if you get into all day events, repeating events, etc. There's some great contributed modules that help take the, the edge off phone numbers if you get into country codes, extensions, and all of that fun. And address field, the commerce address module is fantastic because it, it really shows that business case where if I'm in the United States, I want to see city, state, zip. If I'm in another country, those fields may not be required. It's probably going to be called postal code. And we can conditionally change parts of this form around. So in the previous example, maybe first name is a required field by default, but if you give me your prefix, then I only need your last name. So I can be Jim Vomero or Professor Vomero. You can write your custom validation because you own the form. All right, let's summarize part one. Custom field types, when do you want to use them? When does this feel like the right path? Um, rarely, because you are getting deeper, closer into database, and that's not something most of us should uh, meddle with unless we really feel comfortable in that space. But if you want to be really strict about your data types, not everything's a bar chart, so solid use case. If you want to create more shapes to data, have like the compound fields in my tape case or conditional logic, that's another <coughs> place. You might want to do it at a field level. If sorting, filtering, or computing values is important, that's another case I've used this. Uh, I run a website where we have time cards, and you're putting your hours and mileage in this one field. I'm storing those values together so I can calculate them and run some routines against them. Or for reu reusability, so in a case where I'm going to put a person on multiple content types. I'm going to introduce the other two plugins, and then we're just going to look at some codes. So I promise we'll show some examples, how-tos. Custom widgets. Now, widgets, that's a loaded word, right? We use that in a lot of contexts in the web world. In Drupal, field API, I'm talking about what it means to edit content. So classic example here, if, if you were on an old version of Drupal or just any old CMS, you might see a date field with some sort of, maybe it's what it is, C notation. I forget all the letters that are date times. Uh, it's not human readable. You know, what's stored in the database is not friendly to our editors and authors. We need to give something intuitive. So a date range field with a date picker and a time picker. That makes sense. So when I'm talking about widgets, I'm usually talking about enhancing the form for authoring experience reasons or for maybe validation reasons. But it means instead of showing what's in the database, we can control what that control structure is. <coughs> so already, there's modules that do this date one. And uh, there's, there's modules that do this. I think it's a little more hairy because there's a lot on geolocation. But fairly often, if you're doing anything with map creation, distance routing, you're probably storing something like a longitude and a latitude, or maybe some other spatial ID. You're not going to give that to your end user. At least I hope you, you, you don't have to. You're going to run it through an API. We've all been there, though. 
Google, where it's like, go to this thing, copy the data. So being able to pick, in this case, I forget which Google Maps, or I think it's the places service, where you can just start typing in. This is, this is one I prepared for you know, DrupalCon. Um, they didn't pick me. Oh. <laughs> but uh, you put in the, date, the place, and it's going to handle on a callback the longitude, longitude, and other useful information that I might want to store in the database. So the user never actually has to see what's in the database. A second case for this is really just encapsulating complex controls. So there are times where what you're storing in the database just doesn't really make sense to the end user. We want to add some business logic to it. So I, I certainly could add a checkbox that says I've read this, but for a number of reasons, usually for some sort of compliance reason, someone might need a digital signature. Well, this could just be an HTML5 canvas. I just need to take that element and save it in the database in a useful way. So putting a UI on top of a thing, or likewise, uh, I grabbed this one from that photo, photo or the UI battle on Reddit. Uh, you know, this password is already in use by Mike W. Please create a unique password. <laughs> My point is you can add custom business logic to these fields, give your authors real-time feedback rather than having to wait for them to hit the submit button to say, oh, that's not a valid thing. So we can, we can build it, and then we can also contain it. Right? You're encapsulating all your logic on the field itself. You're not relying on a series of alter pre-processed hooks and all that madness, which we're comfortable. It's there. That, that, those events are there for a reason, but it's usually really hard to trade, chase down and maintain. All right, let's summarize widgets. Why do you do them? When do you do them? When you want to change the format from what's in the database to what you're actually showing your editor. When you've outgrown what Drupal's forms can do and you think you could do something better, if you do, Give it back to the community. We'd love to see it. Uh, or if you want to add some complex business logic or integrate with external services like that Google, the Google one. Any one of these we can override in a theme layer, but really if the logic is about the fields, think it into the field itself. All right, part three, last part of things to introduce. The case for custom formatters. This one is funky because anytime we get into rendering something, you can do it somewhere else in the theme. Um, but I'm going to make the case that some of these are inherent to a field type. My first, I only have a couple examples. But my first case is, as a user in a database, I want to store a URL. That's why I want a URL. But I want my end user to see a QR code. So this is an example of a formatter being really great for adding business logic to something, and it's baked in part of the field. So I add a URL, it generates a QR code using a Google API. I actually have that example we can take check out. Or uh, a countdown to, I guess this is my birthday countdown, one day, 23 hours away. Once again, this is a field thing. Um, so to me, I'm making a judgment call and saying this is inherited to the field, and we'll take a look. But uh, you have to decide if you want to create your own field formatters. There are pros and cons, and feel free to ask me about them later. Uh, or when there's just complicated business logic. So there's a lot going on here. The back end, the thing we're storing in the database is a zip code, the front end, we are going to show some sort of a weather block with fun animations and uh, you know, it has to update to some level. So uh, there's, there's some unique things on there. But what's in the database is not literally what we're rendering to the screen. We already do that all the time. right? You, you store a URL in the database, but you render an iframe. So this is just another example of that. Enough talk, let's code. Uh, so this, this presentation is for, uh, I would say, folks who are in technical leadership roles. So while I am going to look at some code, Check it out later. I'll give you my GitHub links. Um, I'm not looking for people to memorize APIs. That's what documentation's for. I just want to get you acclimated to some plugins. If you've never worked with plugins in the past or anything that's annotated, it might be a little confusing to see all the boilerplate. We're going to look at those, but I'm focusing more on the why than the how to do this. So uh, if, I, if I don't give you a step-by-step, -step, uh, that's, that's intentional. But feel free to ask some questions. I'll make sure I leave some time. Well, let's thank you. No, let's look at some code. Uh, so I created a site for the sake of this. It's a vanilla Drupal site, added a couple of fields, and I just want to maybe just talk about fields in general. So let's create a new content type for this. That, that would be easy enough. Oops. Structure content types. Add a new content type, and we're just going to create a new content type called demo, and I'm going to leave everything super as is. All right, I have a new, my, my new demo content type. When I've talked about the three plugins, the field type, the widget, and the formatter, that's really tied to this, this interface. So our field types are going to be a managed field. This is where we're going to see all our different data types. The widgets are going to be in managed form, and the formatters are in managed display. We'll look at them in that order. So let's add a new field. We'll just see the existing core one before we create our own. Let's add a new field. Site builders are going to be underwhelmed. You've done this. Maybe not. 
I don't know. Let's add a new link field, and we're going to call this, um, I don't know, uh, homepage. No, that's not helpful. My URL. Yeah, that's super generic. Uh, Saving and continue, and I'm just going to accept all defaults. I'm going to assume folks here uh, are familiar with the field API. And here, I've created a new field. Uh, the, the field type is a link that, of course, is the human readable name, but it does have a machine name, too. Let's take a peek at what this looks like in the database. Let's, let's create some content first. Add content. Demo. Hello. And I just accepted the default, so I have the title text and the URL there. And is Ash Jeeves still a thing? I don't know. We'll just go there well. My homepage. Oh, we should have done GeoCities. Too late. We've got to live with the regret. So I have a link field. I've added some data. That one field had two elements it was storing. For folks who don't experiment in the database, this is, this is your chance to maybe get a little tour. Uh, I don't think you need to know this, but it's amazing how much it can refine your programming when you start to understand how Drupal uh, organizes stuff. Uh, I did my best to increase font sizes. I, the, the MySQL workbench just doesn't behave well, so I'll try to describe things. Uh, updated the field, so coming on down, I see that there is a set of tables. Fields are unique per entity. If I were to create a field on blocks or on users, they're going to have a unique set of tables. This is on nodes. So I have a node, field, my URL. Let's inspect that table. And I see that on the, on the bundle content or the, the demo content type, on node ID 2, revision ID 2, uh, there is my URL and my title. So there are the two pieces of the thing I'm storing in the database. Two components stored in one, if I was doing that, maybe we will. Look at that like mega field of all my name pieces. It's nice to be able to separate those. In fact, most Drupal uh, fields are only going to store one value in there. It's a text field that goes in there. I guess if it's a formatted text field, you'll get the, the content and then the text format, you know, filtered HTML, whatever it may be. But in general, Drupal breaks it down and you usually end up with multiple fields. So I have this field, and then I'll also have a field for any revisions of this. So in that case of let me create, I did actually just as a, as a chance to look at it. It's probably in the profile. If I wanted to create all those name fields, prefix, first name, middle name, last name, etc., etc., and each one of these is a custom field in Drupal, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, six fields, that's 12 tables, bare minimum, uh, and they're not really related. I just decided they were related and put them in a field group. So uh, I would like to, before we're done, Let's create, let's, let's do it now. Let's just create a field. Let's do it. I have my repo um, with all these examples available, so I will, uh, I'll make sure that you get a link to that, the closing slide. Pro tip, make sure you're in the password field before typing your password on the screen. Uh, here's an example of the link field. So I wanted to start off by showing what this is and giving you a tour. I'm going to zoom in a little bit because this is a small screen. And hopefully I didn't zoom in so much that everything's truncated. Let's give it a shot. Um, I'll just scrub. This is a link field. And anytime we do something in a plugin, there's usually a naming convention, and the naming convention matters. There's a plugin discovery piece that's looking in specific folders, checking specific namespaces. You don't need to know all of that. Just know that when you're frustrated trying to create plugins, chances are you didn't change the name of something, either the name of your module or the namespace, or in this case, the class is link item, so the file name must be link item.php. And it follows, follows in this case, it, it must be in the module source, plugin, field, field type. You know, all the capitals have to be capital just that way. So you'll find this in any example. There's, there's tools that will help you generate this code. Let's take a peek. Something else that you may or may not be familiar with as we're talking about plugins is this annotation. Uh, love it or hate it, this comment is functional. It has meaning. There's a discovery mechanism that's going to pass these, and uh, usually, I think almost all of them, if not all of them, uh, work on cache clear or some other action where they're going to update an index of all the things it has discovered. So I see that this field, begins with that field type, has an ID of link. It has a label of link, capital L, that's the one we saw in the node form, a longer description. We saw that as well, I think. Uh, it has a default widget. So if you create a link field and don't set a widget, which is what I did, which one do you get? You get the one called link underscore default, a default formatter. 
And then there's some constraints that's probably beyond the scope of today's presentation, but you can think of all the validations and stuff you could put on a link. From there, there's my link item. There's only one method I think you need, and it's the form itself. Let's see if I can successfully go in and out of this while keeping the screen large. Try not to get to my navigation tools, not the settings form. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of the wrong one. So there are two. There are two methods you must have on this. There's the property definition. This is what we're going to describe using uh, the data definition, field storage definition interface. It's, it's a robust one, but there's a lot of examples uh, in Drupal's code. So if you're unfamiliar with this and you're like, what are my options and you can't find it on Drupal.org, I encourage you just to look at examples and I'll do that in a moment. But uh, it's fairly easy to read. It's just sometimes hard to know where to get started. We're saying that our field has actually three things it can store. The URI, so that's the destination. The title, so that string we're going to use for title tags or maybe to replace it. And then a series of options, which can be a bit of a drunk drawer. A lot of modules will throw things into place like that. And each one of these has a label. I'll see these. So that's the um, property definitions method. There's a second method you have to declare in your custom field type for schema. And this is using the database API. So once again, if, if you're familiar with it, this is not worth reviewing. But if you're not acclimated, I'll just kind of go through it a little slower. Um, you're going to talk about each one of those columns that I just mentioned. So URI, title, and options, and describe them thusly. You can copy these and, and see other ones in action, but you can see you're giving it a size, a, a size that's important when you're working in a database. You might also um, pass through some things like some large or unconventional objects you can serialize automatically or say store as a blob. But almost everything you're going to do is going to be like a bar, bar char, int. It's rarely that you're doing anything complex in a database because you want to make sure you're agnostic beyond just uh, you know, MySQL. Uh, and you're saving an index. So, you know, for, once again, I'm not getting a database, but if you're used to sorting and such and searching, indexes are key. Let's create our own. It's nice to look at this. Uh, I am going to cheat and, um, and, and go with the done content because I find that when I code in the session, I just use up all my time. Mm -hmm. um, so, so be it. I'm not going to live code it, but I will show you. I have this module. It's in that shared repo, and it's called Fun Fields. It's where it's going to have all the examples for today. So in source, plugins, field types, I have this one called, what is it called? Mega name. Mega name field is going to use those two methods. Um, I filled out this attribution, so I gave it some unique identifiers. And then I have those two methods. I have the schema method which is going to go through every single thing I want to save in that mega name field. Prefix. I have a prefix for other, like there's, you know, pick Mr., Mrs., etc., and then I have another one that stores other values. Uh, first name, middle name, last name, suffix, and then a nickname. So each one of these, I'm just sort of setting its, its defaults for the interface, and also, well, here's the interface, um, and the one above was for the database. Let me see if I can close this, go back and forth. So being able to pass these properties and say, okay, here's my prefix field, it's labels prefix, here's a description of it for the few interfaces that actually share descriptions. Nothing earth shattering, but hopefully you can use this as a, a starter for when you want to create a custom field. Oh, is empty. I don't know if this one's required by the interface. We can check, but I always like to include this one as well. Uh, for if you were creating a new instance of the content, you fill out the widget and you click submit, what happens if that field was marked as required? Uh, so this is one of the places where I always want to have an is empty method, where I can double check what does it mean to be empty. And in this case, the only thing I said is you have to fill out that last name. If you don't fill out the last name, then throw the error. But I could have changed my own business logic. I could have added dynamic logic. I gave an example of maybe if I have a salutation, that's enough. Your CRM may have some very specific uh, restraints around what it qualifies as like a person. And so you need to maybe mimic that here. So that's my mega name field. Um, since I introduced it, let's add it to our demo content type. Isn't that here? Sure is. Add a field. I already ran the clear caches, so all my fields should be in here. I scroll down till I find yellow. If you see it, there it is. Under general, I have my mega name field. And we are just going to call this mega name. Looks like I make it a little more friendly. I'm going to put GovCon because I, I was experimenting right before this, and I don't want to mess it up. 
You don't want to look at the wrong thing. Cardinality set to 1. I won't make it required. I'm just going to set the default. So this is same use for anywhere else, but ooh, there's my form. Click save. And there we are. My mega name field is on this content type. Let's add a piece of content so we can see it exists. And so, yep, that's the thing. Demo, title body, that URL field we had. Well, my test here. We're going to get real technical on test content names. But here's my field. And we're going to go through the widget next, but this is what it looks like. You can see I've actually seeded the prefix. So that wasn't automated. You haven't seen that part yet. But I'll say Jim, Gomero. DDS, that dentist? I'm not sure. And save. Let's look in the database, and we can at least verify that our custom field type is storing things in this sort of overloaded table. There should be a new field now called GovCon Mega Name. And I see that on node 3, oh, it misses. Cool. Mrs. Jim Vomero DDS. Uh, so this is this is new. We now have a place that has some sort of shape to the data, and we can kind of control how things go into this part of the store using our our, our widget and come out using our, our formatter. Any questions on that? Because I'm going to try to give an example of all three, but uh, this is the one I say you'll probably use the least. I used it recently for like a custom views builder where people are able to pick a content type, pick filters, pick sort. It wasn't the actual views UI. I did it through a custom field. They save all those attributes in that field and I could render it out differently through a view. So it's fun. Um, let's, let's do the widget. We'll continue on this path because this one is substantial enough that we can get some mileage out of it. So in my field type, I said there was a default widget. Now here's, here's a, a beautiful thing that we need to remember. You do not need to make all three of these plugins for any field. You can take a text field and create a formatter and do whatever you want with it. You can create a link widget, but use the default Drupal link field. So you do not need to make these. I'm just showing you an example where I wanted to hit all three of them, but by all means, pick and choose your own adventure. They, they add on very nicely. So I created a new widget called Mega Field Widget. We'll find it. Once again, plugin discovery, it goes source, plugins, and in this case, it's called Field Widget. And there is my mega name widget. I put in any business value that, that, I, that I want into here, try to just like embrace encapsulation. Chances are this thing is getting so big I should have made a service for it. But it also has a plugin. So you set the default values. I'm saying that this applies to field types. This one's important because this is what makes it show up on the forms. Let's take a peek at what, that, what, that, what I just said. So I am on our demo content type. I'm going to go to manage form displays. The field types are here, the, dis the widgets are here, and the formatters are here. So when I am on that field, I get to pick which widget to apply. And some of these have quite a bit. So an example of, where's the one that's like authored by? Nope, that's not it. You know, there's four different formatters that can apply to this. It's just saving, a, let's see, authored by, is that a, that's an entity reference? So it's just saving a, a, an entity ID, it's just a number. But you know, you can have this as a select list, which is, these are all going to render out to things that are human readable. The select list, an autocomplete, checkbox, radio buttons. I have it on the regular autocomplete, not the tag type. So um, you get to pick the widget. Right now, this custom field only has one widget, but I could think of a case where it might have a bunch. So mega name widget. There it is. Mega name widget. I believe I only need one method, although I have a couple of things. Like I have a const for, for all those prefixes. But the only one you need is the form element. Um, if you're ever unsure of how to get started, copy my code. Or what I like to do is just see what I'm extending in widget base, because this is the one that pretty much every other Drupal module is using, and I can get a sense of what other what other methods there are for me to override. So uh, the settings form, I, I'm getting distracted. Stick to the topic, Jim. Um, form elements. So this is the one method that I absolutely have to use. So when an editor is editing the value in this database, what does it look like to them? I encourage you not to go to Reddit for inspiration because those design, bad UI was, was real bad. But for me, uh, introduce another API. You didn't know there's going to be like six APIs in this talk. Um, so uh, Forms API, very easy to get started. I'm guessing most people have used this at some point. I'm saying that the first element is that prefix one, and it's type select. And I've set my default options in an array above. 
In fact, the only thing that's maybe unique to this is I am calling in particular items delta prefix. So if something is already stored in the database, this is where it's going to load into your form. And the delta is there because I like to consider all my fields could be multi-value fields. If you did add another, uh, it would just it would have a new delta to it. So I don't think I did all the four each's you need, but um, so I did assume, but I at least wanted to point that out that when you see these deltas, it's for multi-value fields. Uh, I can add things like in this case it's this, this the state visibility in the field API. So I'm saying that there is a second prefix field called prefix other, and it's only visible when the prefix selector is set to other, and it's only required when the prefix selector is set to other. Let's look what this is. I mean, this has nothing to do with my talk, right? This is just forms API, but let's look anyways, because I think I'm actually giving it some value. So by default, I have my list of prefixes. If I select other, this new one is now here, and it's required. If I turn it off, it is hidden, and it's no longer required because I don't want it to yell at me. So this is an example of adding some business logic to the field itself. I, there's other ways I probably could have done it, but it's part of the field as far as I'm concerned, so I want it right here. Everything else is super straightforward. That's a widget. Done. And the last thing is the formatter. How do I get this thing out of the database and show it to a user? I'm going to make sure I actually made one for this. Let's take a peek. Field type. I made a lot of examples, just in case you had some good questions. Um, so this is the field type definition. I said the default formatter is called mega name formatter. Just like before, follow name convention. Source, plugins, field formatter. There it is. And I only have one at the moment. So my formatter is just called mega name formatter. It's going to list as mega name, and it only applies to mega name fields. If I were to, you know, add on. Uh, link fields, my formatter would now appear for that in that list. But that wouldn't make sense for the data I'm working with. In this one, I think there's only one required method as well. It's view elements. So this is what do we render. I am doing that for each because I'm just assuming that my form might have multi-values. And I'm going to render it out. I wanted to show an example of rendering something through a custom template. I keep saying like this, this is dangerously close to theming work, but I'm trying to encapsulate it. So in this case, I'm taking my field and I am passing all of those values to a template that's beyond the scope of this talk too, but I just wanted to show what it would look like to have a custom template. There it is. So it's nothing special, um, but I'm able to do my, my, my business logic in a, in a pretty clean place. I'm only pa the only thing I'm passing to Twig is the values I want to render and the HTML around it, as opposed to putting like conditional logic. Is prefix set to other, then use this value. Right? I don't have to traverse all that. That's all handled in, in more of a controlled space. Uh, and I click save, and we should see. I don't think I showed it up before. There's my little uh, view of everything that's in that template. Hooray! Uh, I'm going to show off just one more example, um, because uh, I, I want you all to like load this up on your local. And that's a color picker. So I created, I created a new field type. And I'm going to be real quick on this. And the field type has three columns, red, green, blue. And they all contain ints. So this is about storing colors. But that's all it is. That's my color field. I then created multiple widgets for it. So there's a default. Let's look at the form. The default's just letting a user put a number in for red, a number for green, a number for blue, and the number could be between 0 and 255. I have a second color picker. This one's, they each have a different name. The second one is going to use a, a Drupal form element called color. So we're going to put it through this color picker. And then I'm still, still passing the red, blue, green to it. Uh, so I have to do some calculations sometimes. And the third one is a random color. And this is just basically me saying, you can do whatever you want in your form. Think about your authors and create experiences that match their workflows, their work styles, or the sort of language you use in your business. So for me, I, I went all in. Remember I told you I don't know what a grid is? I lied. No, I said I didn't know what a flex, flex box is. Um, I, I don't really know. So someone else hooked me up with the, the form. I just wanted to show an example of attaching JavaScript to a custom widget. Let's take a peek at what this is. And I already have an example of this. I believe it's an article. Nope. Let's try again. Profile. 
Last one. There's only one left. Basic page. Here are my three examples. So same data is being stored. What's being stored are three integers between 0 and 255. And that's exactly what I can put here. So 0, 0, 0. The second was, let's use a color picker. And we'll make this one just straight up red. And the final is, I just wanted to show an example of adding some JavaScript and markup. So this is my ooh, random color picker. I don't know what's going to be there. I refresh the page, something new comes. Maybe I pick that green. So 22, 85, 22. Let's click Save. I need a title. And I see them rendered out. So my first one, 0, 0, 0. My second one was a, a red. And my third one, oh darn, it didn't work. Maybe I didn't click the right one. I'm not sure. But um, Oh, I did. I just have them in the opposite order. So there, that one's all red, and then this is the one, 22, 25, 22. Good. Problem solved. Thanks for rubber ducking that with me. Um, that, is, that is my example of uh, incorporating an, uh, a library and bundling it in with the field. You don't have to add it to a theme and then say, what happens when they're on the admin form? Or what happens when this field is, actually, this is the one that haunts me sometimes. You have, this custom, you have a field, and it looks great on, on, the, on the front end but it's being loaded later in a modal window in the admin interface. And you're like, oh man, i got to style this again. And now you're keeping duplicate styles, or you're moving libraries around. So if I can, if my styles are just about that field, I want to locally sculpt in that field. So there's a chance to do that. I want to show an example of a theme using a template and attaching a library. But that is my session. I brought a lot of other examples, including like QR codes and other shenanigans. Um, but now, let's, let's wrap it so I can answer questions. Um, thank you all so much uh, for coming to this session. There it is. Uh, feel free to reach out if you want to keep this going, if you have any questions along the way. That URL has all the examples I've shown today. It also includes a Lando file if you'd like to uh, get up and running. And I think I included a database, but if not, you can just do Lando Drush SI. It's like install, and it will um, install a blank database and you can see these fields in action. So, uh, um, any questions? Yes? I am very interested in, uh, you said you did an integration with a custom field that we could drive a view. Yeah. I'd like to know more about that. <laughs> I wish I could show the example, but the client doesn't want me to. So I will describe it, and I am slowly convincing them to open source it. Keep saying, you know, I know you love this field, but wouldn't it be greater if a whole army of developers was keeping it up to date? You try. But I will describe it. What I, what I did for the custom view is on my form, on my widget, I, I did whatever the heck I wanted. So I had it dynamically pull our content types and then display mode. So first you pick a content type and then you pick a display mode and it's all with icons. They're actually radio buttons but I replaced them with icons. So if you pick a person, you get the little headshot and then you see the different display modes. So one is a card, a grid, condensed, so you pick your display mode. It's all graphical though. Since I own the field, I own the widget, and I was able to make it really style. It's just it's very graphic. Um, then there's ones for sort order. So I go up and down for, for that sort of thing. Uh, I forget what icon we use for sticky at the top of lists. But as they're going through the widget, they're filling all of these things out. When I get to the bottom of my field, and I think I might have an example in, oops, that's the database. I think I might have an example here where I have to massage some values together. It's probably color picker. Um, yeah, the widget, default, do I have it, or did I skip it? Uh, you're right, it would be the field type. <coughs> Darn, I wasn't sure if I had an example. I, I know there is an example in here, but I'm not going to spend too much time. What I have is on submit. I take all of those values in my custom form. I'm not actually going to store those values individually in the database because I expect my views changer to change over time. And I don't want to create a bunch of columns in a database table that are going to change the meaning and slowly get corrupted, uh, start having like integrity issues. So instead, I take all the elements in that form, I turn them into a JSON object, and I serialize it and I store it in the database. And so anytime I want to render that field, I unpack that object, and now I just have a series of parameters that I can programmatically create a view. 
Yeah, so how, how actually did you feed that to the view? That's part of really interesting. Uh, I don't remember if I used Tweak Tweak, but there's a couple of projects that will help you programmatically create a view in a, a way that's not verbose. And so just in a custom block, I, I call that field, like we're loading it on the node, but I'm rendering it through a block. And I think I think it's tweak tweak like Drupal. Does anyone know it off the top of their head? What? I didn't know it was tweak, but I didn't know it could do that. I thought it was. I could be wrong, but there there are some some modules that will let you uh, programmatically render things like blocks and views. Yeah. And so I am just passing that whole serialized object as a parameter to the view, and then in the view itself, I'm unpacking it and saying, okay, you're a source, you're a filter. Uh, I'm trying really hard to not recreate views. Because that's my, my target audience here are folks who are not very aware of Drupal's APIs. But so on the view side, you have to like expose the filters and all that, and that's how you pass it in the engine. Correct. So I'm passing it in as a contextual uh, argument, yeah, contextual filter, and so um, that could just be anything. So I did create a custom views plugin. If you're interested in how to do that, I made a talk about it. Find it on Drupal TV. But I, I did a, yes, a contextual filter pulls in that serialized JSON object as a strip, just JSON, and then it starts to unpack it in different ways, and it will replace things like our filters. So it'll say, okay, cool, this is just for this content type. It applies that logic late, but it all does it pre-query. So I just, there's there's one, I really want to open source this. I'm going to keep working at it. That is fascinating. You could open source something that is like it, not that specific I hope to. The hardest piece of this, and what's making the code very ugly, is uh, respecting Ajax callbacks when there's multiple dynamic views on a list. Um, it's it's been a lot. So, do you have any examples of where you've used uh, complex fields, like file file fields, in one of these collections of fields? Yeah, um, that's tied into the wider the file API. Sure. Uh, uh, an example there is, and uh, this was for um, a hospital network that had very strict rules, we all know in government, very strict rules sometimes on data storage. So I needed to store user submitted files, that's already scary, into a very specific S3 bucket. And so I, I started to play around with event subscribers and try to grab that file and put it somewhere else. And I eventually decided, no, this is bespoke to what Drupal normally does. So I, I overrode the file logic outright. And um, uh, on upload, I was just grabbing, it was, the, the, the widget would upload the file and then it would get in a callback where a destination like URI. So it, it's, it's not tied into Drupal's file. Like that. You're like taking the file, just sticking it somewhere else. That, that was my use case last yeah. time. It's like, I need to store it. So I stored some sort of code uh, that was like so I could retrieve it later. So that was my use case. I try not to, the hardest, as much as I can, I try not to mess with Drupal's media management because it is an area that's growing so well. Um, and it has a lot of opinionated code in it. So if you start overriding things, you just you, you lose the upgrade path. Right. So I try not to. I will mess with the widget sometimes because uh, I'll get comments from authors like on alt text. You're selecting it from the media manager, and um, yeah. if you've already uploaded it and saved alt text, that's a property of the image asset and the media asset itself. But our authors weren't aware of that because they, they never saw the form again. So I will sometimes mess with the media management form just be like, hey, by the way, this is the alt text. You need to change it. That's a hairy spot. There's a conversation going online, but it's like six or seven yeah, years my old. Use is, I have a lot of these complex components part of Layout Builder, and a lot of them are, use a bunch of entity references yeah. to tie to nodes that have all the field collections, the images, and files in them. And so that works, mm -hmm. but it's got a lot of moving parts. I'm, I'm, I would love to be able to have a custom field that does <laughs> it all, and you just stick that in a block and you're done. Here's the boilerplate for it. Well, I do want to officially thank everyone for coming, but I, I don't need to go anywhere, so let's keep talking. <laughs> so if you have any questions, by all means, I'm going to move this out of the way for the next person. But thank you so much.